Peter and Paul are here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all this morning. We're in a series as Lifehouse, looking at Jesus' vision. The last time we met together, Joe Mayo from Oxford Community Church unpacked for us Jesus' vision for discipleship. How disciples are in community, they spend time with Jesus, disciples make other disciples, and disciples rejoice. And today follows on really well from Joe's talk, as we're looking at Jesus' vision for being the vine. Put simply, the vine is a picture of how Jesus wants us, as his disciples, to relate to him. How, as his disciples, we depend on Jesus. And those of us who have Bibles or phones on us, let us turn together to John 15. Uh, and we're reading verses 1 to 8. Just to set the scene, we're towards the end of the Gospel of John here. We're in the upper room of a house in Jerusalem. Jesus has come into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and he shared the Jewish Passover meal with his friends, the meal that we now know as the Last Supper. Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, has left the room and gone to betray Jesus, giving the authorities the information that will lead to Jesus' arrest and his eventual death on the cross. So this narrative is one of Jesus' last conversations with his disciples before he dies. And this is what he says to them. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, as we've just learned, this is one of Jesus' last conversations with his friends before he's arrested and killed. More to the point, he knows that. So it's clear that what he's saying here is important. It's part of a longer conversation in the upper room of this house in Jerusalem where Jesus prays and commissions his disciples, and he prepares to go to his death. And here we have a story about gardening. <coughs> Unlike most of Jesus' parables or images, on the surface this one is pretty straightforward. We know who is who in the picture. We don't have to go into loads of interpretation to figure out what the vine means. Jesus is the vine. He's the central, life-giving trunk of the plant. His Father, God the Father, is the gardener, pruning branches and removing those that do not bear fruit. The disciples, the eleven gathered in the room with Jesus, are the branches. They're connected to Jesus the vine, and they're making grapes. Hopefully this doesn't just apply to the eleven original disciples, it applies to us too, as we follow Jesus and pursue relationship with him. But it says there are also branches that are cut off from the vine. Branches that do not bear fruit. Looking at the wider context of the passage, the most immediate example of that to us is Judas Iscariot, who has literally just left the room while the other eleven disciples have remained with Jesus. Judas has been with Jesus from the early days. He's one of the original crowd. Yet he's not remained in Jesus. He has left to hand him over to the religious authorities who want to kill him in exchange for money. 
The vine would have been a familiar image to the disciples. In ancient Israel, they'd grown everywhere. It was the perfect climate for growing grapes. But it wasn't just visual familiarity that Jesus taps into with this allegory. Throughout the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures that we have as the first part of the Bible, the nation of Israel is referred to as a vine. But this is often with a negative emphasis. It compares Israel to a vine that hasn't achieved its potential of bearing fruit. Throughout the narrative of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel fails to live up to their identity as God's people. But there is good news. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the true vine. He has come to be everything that Israel couldn't be. Where Israel fell short in being ambassadors of God, Jesus does not. He is the perfect representation of God the Father. Anyone who has seen me, says Jesus, has seen the Father. And Jesus desires to have a relationship with each and every one of us. Jesus' vision for being the vine is a vision for relationship. Together we're going to look at three aspects of this relationship. An abiding relationship, a fruitful relationship, and a dependent relationship. Firstly, we are called to an abiding relationship. Where in the translation that I read from, Jesus commands his disciples to remain in him, other translations say abide, and the meaning of the words is, is pretty similar. Jesus is saying, stay. Stay in me. Stay in relationship with me. Stay connected. The image of the vine and the branches is about how we should draw our physical and spiritual strength from Jesus rather than going it alone. You're probably wondering what this strange little creature is. The biologists in the room might recognise it because it's one of the few things that I remember from biology at school. This is a diagram of xylem and phloem which is the transportation system in plants. They're the tissues that transport water and nutrients from the roots and stem of the plants to the branches and leaves. If I break a branch off a tree, the xylem and phloem in that branch aren't connected to those in the trunk of the tree. They're cut off from the source of nutrients. So in this allegory, Jesus is saying, I am your source of nutrients. Stay connected to me. Keep the xylem and flow of it intact. And that's what abiding means. It's to dig into Jesus, to draw our spiritual strength from him and him alone. And that's what the Apostle Paul writes about when he writes of being in Christ. It is a deep relational connection that relies on him to sustain us, to keep us going, just as the stem and the roots of the palm maintain the branches. Jesus promises that if we remain in him, he in turn will remain in us. When I was baptised, someone shared this passage with me, and her message was, Chris, it's simple, it's straightforward. If you remain in Jesus, he will remain in you. So there's a simplicity and a solidness that can be found in our relationship with Jesus. Because at his heart, it's completely grounded in what he's done for us. Through his gracious sacrifice on the cross, where he died in our place. There is nothing we can do to drive him away. No mistake that we can make that will wreck this relationship if we choose into relationship with Jesus. But just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's easy. Sometimes staying or remaining in Christ is staying where you are. It's like resting on the sofa after a long day. But sometimes it's more like standing fast or standing your ground in battle, where you dig your feet into the ground to get good footing, you lower your center of gravity and you brace for impact. There's a digging in. It's not a passive word. Abiding is an active seeking. 
It's a pursuing of deeper and deeper relationship with Jesus, of greater reliance on him. We have a choice to go deeper with Jesus, to foster this attitude of abiding. It's this spiritual training that Nikki was talking about earlier. We can grow our faith muscles, our abiding muscles, through disciplined practice. Let's think about it this way. For some of us, faith is like a pair of loose-fitting trousers. It's comfortable, it keeps us covered, it does the job, it's warm, it's cosy. But when times get hard and you have to get moving, running around, that's when your trousers start to fall down. And when your trousers are around your ankles, that's when you trip, fall over and hurt yourselves. But being disciples, choosing to abide in God and choosing to pursue ever deeper relationship with him, that's like choosing to put on a belt with the trousers. I know that if I'm wearing a belt, my trousers are likely to stay up no matter how hard I have to run. No matter what life throws at us, if we are abiding in Jesus, deeply rooted in him, we can know that he is with us too, and that will keep our trousers of faith intact and on our bodies. So what is our belt? What does abiding look like? It's not an easy, oh, here's four points, go and do them and your life will be changed forever. Abiding in Jesus, relationship with Jesus, is the story of our lives. It is written over years. And for each of us, that will look different. That being said, it is four points <laughs> that might help us grow as disciples of Jesus. <laughs> Firstly, we've got B for Bible. There's a challenge to go deeper in how we read the Bible. Learning its lessons and treating it as having life-changing power, which it does. It's the word of God. It transforms us and renews us. There's a challenge to read it like that. We can study it. We can mull it over in our minds. That's what Psalm 1 talks about when it describes a person whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on it day and night. We mull on God's word and we find truth and life in it. E is for examine. I haven't spelled that wrong. It's a pattern of prayer often used at night to reflect on the events of the day. For those of you who use the Lectio 365 prayer app, the nighttime one is based on a pattern of examine. We can ask ourselves questions as part of this prayer. What was I abiding in today? If it wasn't Jesus, what was it? If I wasn't abiding in Jesus, I was probably abiding in something else. Maybe anxiety or fear, self-absorption or ambition. I can talk to Jesus about my desire to remain more in him. L is for listening, which is by far what I find the hardest about connecting with Jesus. We need to learn to take the time to be still and listen to Jesus, to rest in his presence and allow him to speak to us rather than spending all our time in prayer bombarding him with our whims and requests. And T is for thanksgiving. As we learn to rely on Jesus as our source, it's important to practice gratitude, giving thanks for Jesus, to Jesus for how he abides in us provides for us and answers our prayers. Every good thing we have comes from God. And it's an important practice for us to remember that. So we're called to an abiding relationship. We've got our B-E-L-T of abiding relationship that keeps our trousers of faith in place. Secondly, we're called to a fruitful relationship. Jesus tells us that if we remain in him, and he remains in us, we will bear much fruit. The spiritual fruit in our lives glorifies God. That means it's important. 
If we're abiding in Jesus, we should be fruitful. But for each of us, a fruitful relationship with God will look different. We're all unique, and God is unique, infinite, and unknowable. Comparison between us is pointless. We all produce different fruit from our relationships with God. Say my relationship with God produces pineapples and, and Mark's produces cherries. You can't judge a cherry on how pineapple it is. So we all produce different fruit. But one thing we do have in common is that we're all going to be pruned. God the Father has the authority. He is in control of his garden. But also he is tender. Quite literally, he tends the garden. And through pruning it, he encourages it to bear more fruit. As we go deeper in relationship with God, he highlights to us where in our lives we choose not to abide in him. And encourages us to continue to put him first in every area of our lives. We are saved and cleansed through Jesus' death on the cross for our sins. But we need to go on being saved and cleansed as we're discipled by God and by those around us. Where parts of us stop producing fruit, they need to go to enable us to fruit to our full potential. So what fruit are we called to produce? Well, firstly, we're called to be fruitful in spirit. Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we go deeper in our abiding relationship with Christ, we start to look more like Him. We are transformed into God's spiritual likeness as we get to know and understand Him better. These qualities of the fruit of the Spirit don't just happen. Like real fruit, they take time and intentional cultivation for us to grow them. And the growing of these qualities in our character should spill over and bless those around us. External fruitfulness brings delight as we serve and we do good works in our communities. After this passage about the vine and the branches, Jesus immediately starts talking about the importance of love. And earlier in the conversation, he said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So loving one another is the identifying fruit of the Christian life. In the same way that you can tell an apple tree from the fact that it has apples on it, or a grapevine from the grapes that are growing, you should be able to tell that we're following Jesus by the way that we love one another as Jesus loves us. As each of us is transformed more and more into Jesus' likeness through abiding relationship with him, so too is Lifehouse Community Church transformed to more accurately reflect the glorious person of Jesus Christ. We're called to be faithful in prayer. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. As we grow in genuine relationship with Jesus and practice obedience to his word, Jesus says our prayers will be answered. Through spending time with him, our wishes and desires naturally become more in line with his. And that's where we see answers to prayer. Our prayers echo the prayers that Jesus himself is already praying. This is why it's important to reflect on and celebrate answers to our prayers. We get to see the fruit of the kingdom of God. It's a harvest festival. And thirdly, we're called to fruitfulness in mission. The fruit of the Spirit at work in our lives and the fruit of answered prayer is fruit that has seeds in it. We're not seedless grapes, we're seeded grapes. As we see fruitfulness in our own lives, the seeds are sown for more fruit to spring up around us. Abiding in Jesus and having a deep relationship with him 
means you want to tell other people about it. As disciples, we're commissioned to go and bear fruit. Not just character qualities in our lives, but fruit in the lives of others. Disciples naturally make disciples, because you want to tell people about the fruit in our lives and the vine that caused it to grow. Brings me on to the only bit of my notes I have in full capital letters, which is that the purpose of bearing fruit is to glorify the vine and the gardener, not the branch. The purpose of fruitfulness in our lives is to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves as his disciples. Once I start taking credit for the things that God is doing in my life, making it about me rather than about him, that's when I can be sure I'm headed for a good pruning session. It's written, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God, would you keep us humble? And we should be humble, because it's Jesus that's doing all the work anyway. So we're called to an abiding relationship with God. We've had our four tools to help us with that. A Bible, examine, listening, and thanksgiving. Secondly, we're called to a fruitful relationship. To be fruitful in spirit, to be fruitful in prayer, and to be fruitful in mission. Lastly, we're called to a dependent relationship. Our connection to the body is dependent on our abiding relationship with Jesus. As I've said already, it can't be estimated by our external appearance of fruitfulness. We can't compare with one another. Only Jesus knows whether we're in him or not. From what I can tell, none of the 11 disciples that were there for that last supper knew that Judas would be the one to betray <coughs> Jesus. After all, he'd been there with the rest of them for the missions, the teaching, the miracles, the spending time with Jesus. Over those three years, he must have professed some sort of allegiance to Jesus. But Jesus knew the true condition of his heart. We're called to live in a way that is wholly dependent on Jesus. Where our belief isn't genuine, where it's not rooted in an abiding relationship with Jesus, we don't bear fruit. Once union with the vine is broken, the nutrients can't get from the vine to the branch. The branch can't bear fruit if those xylem and phloem aren't connected together. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's the flip side to remain in me and you'll bear much fruit. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But apart from me, you can do nothing. As usual, Jesus is pretty blunt here. He uses alternate language. It's not, eh, apart from me, you'll be able to do some things. They'll, they'll not be as good as the things you could do if you were in me, but that's fine. It's, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And the image of the wine further emphasizes this alternate language. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, they're thrown into the fire and burned. I've been working with wood for quite a bit over the last few years, and I found this really interesting. For most trees, if you chop a branch off, you can use it for something, you can turn it into planks. But Jesus, the carpenter, Notice that the wood of a grapevine is too soft and the trunks and the branches are too thin to make anything useful out of. This is a vine on the right here. It is so gnarled and twisted that you can't get any straight planks from it. And when you go to dry the wood, it splits like crazy because vine wood has such a high moisture content. 
It's those xylem and phloem again. It's too saturated with sap to be able to build anything from it. Even now, in modern times, when our technology for building and working with wood has come on so much, people still don't build stuff with grapevine wood. All it is good for is burning. When you search grapevine wood on Google, most of what you're given is charcoal, or wood for burning and smoking things. A lifeless vine branch bears no fruit, and even its wood is good for nothing but burning. It's right there in Ezekiel 15. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, how is the wood of a vine different from that of a branch from any of the trees in the forest? Is wood ever taken from it to make anything useful? Do they make pegs from it to hang things on? And after it is thrown on the fire as fuel, and the fire burns both ends and chars the middle, is it then useful for anything? If it was not useful for anything when it was whole, how much less can it be made into something useful when the fire has burned it and it is charred? Without Jesus, we couldn't save ourselves. Our faith was to be cut off forever. Without Jesus, we are all fruitless branches. We're fit for nothing but throwing in the fire. Without Jesus, we are nothing. We are burned vine wood. We are split, charred, and useless. And it is from this point, this humble perspective, this level playing field of grace that Jesus chooses to begin his transformative, saving work in each one of us. Just as Jesus and his disciples broke bread together, just before the passage we've looked at today, we're going to take communion now. We know the fruit of the vine, the wine of communion. It's a symbol of sacrifice and it's a symbol of love. And we enjoy this union of being the branches of Jesus' vine, only through his blood shed on the cross for us. We know that as Jesus' disciples, we need constant pruning, constant cleansing. We take communion to remember that our sinful bodies are made clean by Jesus' broken body. And our souls are washed through his most precious blood. And because of that gift of grace, we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Anyone here is welcome to take communion if you are seeking to follow Jesus with personal faith. If you don't want to take part for any reason, we'd encourage you just to use this time as a quiet time of prayer and reflection. Uh, but we do have bread and wine up on the table there. Rich is going to come and play something for us. Um, if you don't want to get up and get it, you can ask someone to get it for you. So yeah, I'd encourage you to make your way to the table.
divine blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin.